good evening, welcome. The meeting is called to order. Um, roll, may we have roll call, please. Dana. Here. Jones. Here. Montesino. Sarmiento. Here. Leach Olson. Here. Rivera. Hammer. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Once again, good evening and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting for June 5th, 2018. Um, I'd like to start by, um, we have a change in the agenda and um, item 5B, which is 1902 Freedom Boulevard, is going to be continued at a future meeting, so that one will not be heard at this meeting. The second thing I'd like to do is introduce our newest member. <laughs> um, we have Jenny Veach Olson, and she is representing District, is it three? Three, that's what I thought, okay, District Three. So welcome, Jenny. Um, and we can start with uh, item agenda item number three, presentations and oral commu communications from the public and the planning commission. Um, this Time is set aside for members of the general public to address the Planning Commission on any item not on the agenda, <coughs> which is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. No action or discussion shall be taken on any item presented, except that any commissioner may respond to statements made or questions asked and may ask questions for clarification. All matters of an administrative nature will be referred to staff. All matters relating to Planning Commission will be noted in the minutes and may be scheduled for discussion at a future meeting or referred to staff for clarification and report. Any commissioner may place matters brought up under oral communications on a future agenda. All speakers are asked to fill out a card and leave it at the podium announce their name and address in order to obtain an accurate record for the minutes. So do we have any members of the public that would like to speak to the Planning Commission? Please come forward. Good evening, um, Planning Commission, um, gentle gentlemen and gentlewomen. My name is Jessica Jensen. Excuse me, I'm a little <coughs> tired. Um, <coughs> and I live at 1778 Santa Victoria Avenue. Are you, are you going to speak on an item that is on the agenda or I'm not? I'm not sure what, I, was it posted on here? I came a little late. I the the agenda? See, yeah. Um, you can pick up an agenda outside, um, just go through the doors and they're right in the um, front as you come in the, the doors okay. there. I will go um, and double check that before I. Okay, <laughs> that's a <laughs> get my bounce. <laughs> Thank you. No, no problem. Um, let's go to oral communications from the Planning Commission while she checks. So let's start with Jenny Sarmiento, Commissioner Sarmiento. I had something in mind that I wanted to say, but as I came up here, I completely forgot. <laughs> but <laughs> I would like to say that I attend uh, Toastmasters with some of the city staff, and I promised them that I would not be caustic today <laughs> when they do their presentation. So if any of you have attended any Toastmaster meetings, you know that there's um, a word is being introduced, and so that was my word yesterday, and I'm trying to learn how to use it. So that is it. Thank you, Commissioner Sarmiento. Commissioner Beach Olson? Yeah, thank you so much for a warm welcome. I'm happy to join you all up here this evening. Um, I have 
two quick things. The first one is that the RTC is holding a public session to consider the draft agreement for the new rail service operator, uh, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line on Thursday, June 14th at 9 a.m. here in the City Council Chambers. So if you're interested in the rail trailer associated projects, I would encourage you to um, attend that meeting. And then the second one was just a congratulations to the city staff and um, Bike Santa Cruz County and the other community partners who put on a very successful Open Streets Watsonville this past weekend. Um, I saw pictures from the event and it was well attended and the weather was of course beautiful and I'm always in favor of events where people get outside and interact with their neighbors in a safe and fun way. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Montesino. What did I need? I was at the. Uh, I, was, I happened to be at the open streets event. It was wonderful to see the community come out and walk and bike and and get some information how um, uh, we can be healthy. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Uh, I just wanted to say that I uh, I, I ran in my first 10K race on the Paro Valley Women Shelter Mother's Day run. It was an amazing event. Uh, and the number of runners were, uh, the turnout from the community was tremendous. So just want to say that uh, if you ever get a chance to, to support that particular um, entity, it, th it's a great event and they do great work. Thank you. Commissioner Dana? Well, first I'll say to Jenny, that happens to me every day. <laughs> Some people call it a senior moment, but you and I are not that old yet. <laughs> there must be another reason. I'd also like to say to all my friends in Watsonville that we have a couple more hours to vote. And I would say the way our world and country is today, it's one of our last uh, rights that we have to make a difference. So I would say to everybody, I did my, I voted. I didn't want my mom to see me on TV and <laughs> see that I had not voted. So mom, I have the sticker on, I did vote. And I suggest it to all my friends. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, Rivera. <laughs> I'd just like to echo what Rick had to say that, uh, you know, it's a big day. Make sure you go out and vote. Uh, it was a very big day in my household. My fiance, uh, Anna, this was the first election she was able to vote in. So we just came from voting and that was a very, uh, that was a very nice experience. So just go out there and do your civic duty and to all the candidates out there. It's tough running. Thank you for running. And, you know, I wish the best of luck to everyone. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple of things um, on some mid-May, I can't remember the exact date, but we had Bike to Work Week and um, so many city employees came out and, and rode and there were several people who rode um, their bikes to work for the first time. It was amazing, they were so excited and it was really great to see so many people participate in Bike to Work Day and um, Edgar Maravilla came out in his decked out in his entire outfit, and <laughs> Justin Me came <laughs> his um, bicycle attire, and so and Maria Esther was there, and so thank you to all who participated in that. Also, um, Open Streets was a uh, highly succe successful event. Um, it was fun to participate and um, there were a lot of people, a lot of enthusiasm, and I wanna echo what um, Commissioner Veach Olson said about the meeting next, not this Thursday, but next Thursday on June 14th with, with the RTC. Um, they're going to be voting on a rail contract for the Santa Cruz branch line, so it's important that we either attend or you can also um, email the RTC or you can also email um, the the district representatives, so thank you. Um, are there any more oral communications from the public? Is that, did that's okay. So <laughs> um, let's move on to item number four, which is the consent agenda. Um, do we have a motion approving the minutes for the April 3rd meeting? I'll make a motion. To approve the, the minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second that. The motion has been um, made and seconded. Do can we have roll call, please? Chair, who who seconded? Um, it Thank was um, Commissioner Montesino. Oh. Thank you. Dana. Yes. Jones. Yes. Montesino. Yes. Sarmiento. Yes. Beach Olson. I'll abstain. 
Rivera? Yes. Hammer? Yes. So moving on to the public hearings, um, item agenda A is a public hearing to consider the Planning Commission's recommendation to the City Council to adopt the City's 2018-2019 Capital Improvement Plan, which is CIP, with proposed public improvements and find the projects are consistent with the general plan. Um, can we start with a staff report, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Oh, Murray, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we were very excited about this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I did that. I'm sorry, Murray. That's terrible. Please accept the report. I'm sorry. All right, we're going to go back to item 3A, which is a presentation by Principal Engineer Murray Font. Font? Is it yes? Font? Um, on the downtown Watsonville Complete Streets Plan. Thank you, Chair Kammer and Commissioners. I'm pleased to present to you the City of Watsonville's Complete Streets Plan and share with you how it coincides with the specific plan that the community development is working on. The City received a $225,000 Sustainable Communities Grant from the State of California to develop the plan. What is a complete street, you may ask? It is one that has facilities for all users. In the past, city streets were built primarily for vehicles, with pedestrians and bicycle facilities being an afterthought. As this slide shows, complete streets are for everyone. They are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users of all ages and abilities. The purpose of this plan is to develop a plan, a planning document that improves safety and access for pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities. The project area is downtown Watsonville, as shown on the slide, and involves those road segments that are included or bounded by Brennan Street, Union Street, Riverside Drive, Rodriguez Street, Freedom Boulevard, and Main Street. The city is partnering with Caltrans and the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and has hired Calendar and Associates of San Jose to assist. The project is broken into four tasks and each involves public outreach. The first was to identify design concepts that address the needs and concerns of the community. The city hosted booths at the farmer's market and the Day of the Child celebration where participants were surveyed on their travel habits in the downtown and asked to comment on various design concepts, including amenities such as enhanced crosswalks, green bike lanes, and parklets. This task is complete. We're now into the second task, which is to analyze community needs, excuse me, analyze the survey data and prepare design alternatives that incorporate the concepts that address community needs, then invite community comment. These design alternatives will be presented as plans showing improvements to particular road segments, and they will also be presented digitally on telephone apps and three-dimensional viewers. The presentations will be in August and include a booth on Saturday at the Strawberry Festival. The third task, which will begin in the fall, is to propose a plan of preferred alternatives as reflected by the community's interests and their input. And then finally, the plan itself will be adopted in February of next year. After adoption, it would be implemented either through funding secured by the city or as condition of development for improvements that are going on within the project area. This slide shows some of the input from the recent surveys. The pie chart indicates how people get to the downtown area the bar, the bar chart shows how often people visit the downtown, and the map shows which routes people take through the downtown. This slide shows which improvements were preferred by those who took the survey. The preferred style of the improvements is historic. The preferred pedestrian improvements involve lighting. The two most preferred alternatives for amenities include trees and decorative lighting and 
among bike improvements, the biggest request was for additional bike lanes. On this slide, one pie chart shows that people visit various places in the downtown area. The other pie chart indicates that just over half the people surveyed consider the downtown traffic to be manageable or not a problem. The bar chart shows that the most preferred street design option on the three primary corridors, that is Brennan and Union Street, on Main Street, and on Rodriguez Street, is to improve the pedestrian facilities. These preferences are being incorporated into the design alternatives that will be presented in August. The downtown complete streets plan and the downtown specific plan have over overlapping study areas and overlapping time frames. They also have shared objectives. Both are looking at ways that will improve the downtown area and to develop plans and guidelines that can be implemented with future development. Fortunately, the complete streets plan will be done early next year and a specific plan will be completed in the fall of that year. This will allow recommendations from the complete streets plan to be considered for and incorporated into the specific plan. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Um, do we have questions? Anybody on the commission questions? Co comment? Go ahead. So Murray, on something like this, it's a plan. So does a plan like this cost $225,000 to do a plan or do you, or is that, what do you do if there's, does it cost that? And if, the, if it does, then what do you do with the funds? Can they go toward whatever improvements are decided or? How's that work? The, the two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars goes toward the plan, right? But a plan like that would—that's how. Well, it actually costs a little more. There's some local share that's being put in. All right. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Is there any possibility that in the in the future Walker Street would be also incorporated in the plan because there is a lot of traffic and there's also um, a lot of pedestrian and bicycle traffic on Walker. <coughs> I'm, shame on me, I'm drawing a blank. Help me find Walker Street. Walker is south of Rodriguez, the next street over. At this time, it's not included in this particular study. However, the city is doing some other research such as Vision Zero and a second complete streets plan that involves schools where it might be considered. Right, because I see as we develop and um, make some changes to the downtown to Main Street, more people will use Walker. I use Walker all the time. It's easier to get through town a lot faster as well. And you know, I see a lot of traffic as well. You're talking about as a driver, is that correct? As a driver, okay. but I do see a lot of um, bicycles and pedestrians trying to avoid the downtown area. The, the bike path actually goes Main Street and then you have to make uh, a right and go to Rodriguez. The, that's where the bike lane is. Um, so you have to make a right off of Main to, to stay on the bike lane. Um, after that, intersection of Rodriguez, the Main Street doesn't have a bike lane. Um, so, yeah. It <laughs> uh, other comments, questions? Yeah, I have one. Would you pull up the slide with the bar graphs? Um, specifically, I was interested in how, the one prior to that, I think. Yes. Um, so, under the style choices, so how did this polling take place? Um, and I, I was kind of interested in how did people come to like historic versus contemporary, really five points is not that big of a, a difference, but if you could speak a little bit about like, did they have little pictures and they could pick which one they kind of liked? Sure. Let me show you an example. At the bottom of this slide, there's a series of pedestrian improvements and when the surveys took place, there were posters put out with areas below each of these pictures and individuals were given a, a circle to post under the ones that they chose. So the, the four alternatives that are shown here were the four that were presented. 
ideally they voted for one, right. but. Other questions? Um, Marie, I have one um, question for in August um, at the Strawberry Festival is what specifically is going to be um, happening at that, at the booth for that? There will be visual displays, maps and plans showing where some of these improvements could be done on some of the corridors with alternatives. One may show improvements that favor bicycles. Another might be that same area showing improvements that favor pedestrians. And individuals will be asked or surveyed to see what their preference is. We also will have a unique opportunity through the Regional Transportation Commission to view these same things on 3D viewers, the goggles, or you can do a phone app, and you'll be able to, to see them, literally, to turn your head and check it out, and also to vote. And if you've, as, if you've been to our booze, you'll know that it's done in both Spanish and English. And that, that date is August 2nd, is that, or 3rd, somewhere in there? I think the third is a Saturday. First weekend, okay. So, okay. so I encourage um, people to please participate and go to the Strawberry Festival. It's, it's on the Saturday of the Strawberry Festival, is that correct? Yeah, because um, it, it's, it's important that, you know, uh, lots of us give an input so that uh, it's pleasing to as many people as possible. So, Some of the apps will be available to do online, and the city website will also include a link. So. If you can't make it to the festival, you can still share your. So people can sort of vote online. You can still vote thing. online, okay. yes. Great. And until what is it only on that day or from one date to another? August. August, during August. Okay. All right. Other things? No? Marie, anything else? Thank you so much for presenting. Um, so we will move on to the public hearings. Um, I won't read it again, but um, we're, we're going to hear about the capital improvement plan, which is, so um, do we have a staff presentation? Good evening, commissioners. My name is Cindy Serwin. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the City of Watsonville. I'm here with Sylvia Diaz, Financial Analyst, who I want to just publicly thank for um, all the hard work she did. She's the primary person working on, on this plan. So with that, um, just going to, I'm here to, today to present to you the City's five-year capital improvement plan the first year of which is gonna be requested to be appropriated in the um, council's budget presentation coming up next week. So the city's charter states that the planning commission shall have the power and duty to list and classify annually all proposed public improvements recommended by officers, departments, boards, or commissions of the city and recommend to the city council and the city manager a coordinated program of proposed public improvements for the ensuing five-year period according to a logical order of priority. So based on that, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the process that we went to, through to prioritize and decide um, which projects would be funded in this year and in the, the ensuing five-year plan. First step is that all departments were to ask, ask to submit their project sheets to the finance department in March. The process varies somewhat um, depending on the funding source because many of the funding sources included in this plan are very restricted. Um, enterprise funds, um, <coughs> utilities, water, sewer, et cetera, can only be used on utility-related projects. Um, many of our special revenue funds are very highly restricted um, based on the funding source, whether it's a grant um, for state, federal, whatever funding. Most of the funding sources that are not general fund are very restricted. So those restricted funds um, went through a, a fairly internal process and were allowed to do so, um, checking in with the finance department to make sure that um, their cash flow projections for the next five years would actually cover what they were projecting. But internally, um, particularly the enterprise departments, 
I know went through a stringent process where um, their managers of different divisions and levels had to present to senior management um, based on, on the projects and timelines and need. And, um, and it was collectively decided within the departments how they were going to um, face fund the departments or fund the projects. Transportation projects, um, there's a lot of them in this, in this plan. Um, again, they're based, based on very specific funding sources, many from and coming from the state, and they have a lot of restrictions. Um, but internally, I know that the um, engineering divisions primarily looked at um, safety, what fit within the funding source use, and then and the various impacts. For example, uh, a major thoroughfare would have a higher priority than, than a side street, depending on the condition of the road, et cetera, et cetera. The general fund process was a little bit more open um, because there's a lot, the general fund is much more limited. So projects with no other identified source of money had to com compete for a very limited amount of general funds. A um, capital planning committee was formed with representatives from each department in the city that was requesting funds of the general fund. The finance department and then building maintenance and engineering um, personnel within the city. That committee came together, and their first order of business was just to actually decide what criteria, by which criteria they would evaluate the projects. This is how we decided to prioritize. Um, we decided to rank projects and assign essentially a point system to projects, and they would get one or two points for each one of these criterias. Um, so does the project impact more than one department? Is the project addressing a, uh, a liability for the city? Is the infrastructure at risk for immediate failure or, um, or at very short term in need of an, would it be in need of an emergency repair? Is the project addressing a legislative mandate? Does the project enhance the public image for the city? And is the project important for public safety? Em employee safety under comfort, not just the public. Um, will the project result in operational cost savings? The flip side of that is if a project was going to result in operational costs, it was um, lower on the list. Does the project maintain a current asset as opposed to creating a new one, which would be in the future be required to be maintained? And does the project have matching or grant funds available that we wanted to take advantage of? So based on initial um, departments, we're asked to go through their, their projects, their proposals, and just assign a number. Um, but of course, that's quantitative, and we had to get into the nuances of the qualitative side of all of this. So after just an initial ranking was placed on all of the projects, we sat as a committee and um, discussed the projects in detail. And essentially, departments had to kind of fight it out um, for um, to... to, to um, to get their projects to the top of the list. We had, um, in that first year, we had, over, we had over $22 million of general fund projects proposed over the course of the five years. And um, what we're actually fitting into the budget this year, the target dollar amount was only $500,000. So it was, it's quite the struggle. Um, we did wind up bumping that up. It's a little bit higher in the budget year. We were able to squeeze in a little more. It's going to be $571,000. And in each of the, the following um, years of the plan, it's a little closer to $550,000, $600,000. But that still leaves about $19, $19 million of unfunded projects. Um, so <clears throat> luckily, our, I mean, our, our committee was very receptive to, and I thought, I think, thought through the process, um, not just thinking of their own departments and then thinking of the cities as a whole. So we were able to narrow the list down, um, shift projects from one year or, an, or another, so that maybe if we couldn't get to it this year, we would get to it next year or at some point in the five-year plan. <clears throat> we, um, again, I said, as I mentioned, that leaves us with an, about $19 million of unfunded projects. We're, they're, they're remaining in the plan um, as an indicator to the public of the need of our capital. Uh, capital, we have not spent general fund money on capital in a number of years. And um, also, 
that unfunded list of projects will, um, staff will continue to look for outside funding sources, possible grant funding, um, possible other state sources or state or federal sources as they come available. Um, and that, that project list they'll, will be there as the starting point for should any future general fund money become available, we will start with that list as opposed to a whole new um, or a new request. So that said, this is um, a summary of our five-year plan by funding source. So as you can see, even though I know it sounds very shocking to say we have such an unfunded, a high unfunded number in the general fund, overall we are spending quite a bit of money on capital projects through all, all the various sources that we have available to us. You know, in the current, or in the 18-19 fiscal year, we are proposing in total $22.2 million of capital be appropriated. And then over the course of the five years, uh, we will hopefully, as protections, if protections continue as they are, be spending over $109 million on capital. <coughs> um, so I know th there's a big numbers and it's very encouraging um, to put that unfunded number in the general fund in context of what we're actually being able to accomplish in the city based on the funding we have available. Uh, same slide, just split a different way showing um, how we're funding or which departments are going to get some of these appropriations. Of course, the largest, the largest departments are, are the utility funds. They have huge capital needs, and that is funded out of ratepayer money. Um, in the other funds, the other funds are more um, general fund, or um, they're, they're a combination of general fund special revenue funds, uh, Measure G, um, CDBG, and some other funding sources that kind of are making up the bulk of where the other departments are getting their money. So just some examples of the types of projects that are included in this plan. You have the, the big book that details all of, all of the projects. Um, but some of the projects that we're able to, some of the examples of the types of things we're able to accomplish in this plan is um, finishing some back bathrooms at Ramsey Park, starting some permanent bathrooms at the city plaza here, vehicles for the parks department, um, gym floors, um, building repairs, facelifts to some of our parks, courts and field resurfacing. Um, public works is um, more just kind of the maintenance of the city facilities and city buildings. So just some basic things we're doing, HVAC upgrades, parking resurfacing, um, some work to the Beach Street garage doors and elevators. The police department is able to, um, is going to be able to finish some work at a women's locker room. Again, address their HVAC situation, put some more money into body-worn camera projects, um, and then work on some security at the station across the street here. Transportation, as you heard from Murray, um, one of the projects being funded in this plan is the Complete Streets Plan. Um, so, but across all the various transportation sources, including SB1, Measure G, gas tax, um, there's a lot of improvements scheduled to be done for paving, curb signage, signals, pedestrian crossings, trails, bike lanes. Um, you, I mean, we've seen some of the work in the past year and, and it's exciting to see that continuing. And then of course our utilities. Um, the airport has some parking lot construction slated to happen. They are um, <coughs> scheduled to build a new operations center and then some repairs to the runways and extension. Um, the airport, a lot of their funding is actually split between their own revenues and FAA grants and FAA support of the, their funding. So much of the projects that you see, I think it was 1.8 million is actually not coming out necessarily of the airport itself. It is, is in partnership with the FAA. Um, sewer department has a lot of upgrades and replacement of pipes, sewers, a lot of vehicles and equi equipment. Their major project that they have coming up is actually a replacement of the headworks, which is where <coughs> all the sewer flows into the um, treatment plant. And so they actually are needing to build essentially an entire new receiving receptacle and that will happen uh, uh, next to the current one and eventually when it's finished they'll be connected up. That project is um, 
so large that it's not necessarily fitting within their their normal cash flow and they will be I think seeking some bond funding for that which just helps spread the cost out for for the ratepayers water department is um, replacing meters pipes and equipment um, their biggest project in in this five-year horizon is um, chromium-6 treatment plants and that project has been on and off again and it is still I think um, it, it still depends on on state regulations and that one also will um, be looking for outside funding sources um, either low interest loans or bonds or some other source to help smooth the cost of that project solid waste and the landfill um, most of that their money is focused on vehicle replacement um, because so many, their, their vehicles are very costly and very important because without them, our garbage doesn't get collected. They're also working um, at the Municipal Service Center on building a new administration building. And then of course, within the five-year horizon, there is cost related to the closure of the landfill. So with that, that is what is included in our capital improvement plan. Um, I have representatives here from most departments if you have questions on any specific projects. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. <coughs> Do we have questions from the commission? Um, start at the end and then so. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide where you have uh, the different departments in the five years, I think, the total cost? Yes, thank you. Um, if I am looking at the police department on 22-23, uh, uh, does that mean that uh, Measure G will be gone, or is that that there won't be any other funding to support some of those activities? Or Measure G actually is scheduled to sunset at the end of fiscal year 2021. Okay. Um, and so what's represented here in the police department is a combination of general fund and Measure G funding. Um, the fact that they have no projects in fiscal year 22, 23 um, simply means it's a combination of those things, right? Their, their projects um, did not, f if they have any additional projects for that fiscal year, they did not fit within our funding frame. I believe they probably have unfunded projects listed for that year. And yes, that represents that there's no additional Measure G money currently scheduled for that fiscal year. Thank you. Other questions from the commission? Commissioner Montesino. The question going to, uh, off of the city improvement program. Uh, put something out there. Um, so how would one, um, I'm looking at page 197, and it, it, it lists a risk of park playground renovation as new and high priority. For a small little park and neighborhood of parks, but then on list on page 227, um, I think it's 227. I uh, yeah, 227 Ramsey Park playground renovation, which would get utilized even more. Has I don't know, it does have a high priority. I, uh, I was looking at it wrong, I thought it has low priority. Um, so I just wanted to uh, how. You yeah. guys came up to, you know, priority basis. So departments went through actually several rounds of prioritization. When they initially submitted their forms, which is what you're seeing in the book, they ranked things as high, medium, or low. Um, and what you tend to get back when you ask of that of departments is that every comes back, everything comes back as high priority. Um, and so we did go through several other rounds of prioritization that did not get published. Um, as I mentioned, we had a point ranking system where we assigned a numerical value to each of the projects. And then beyond that, we qualitatively as a team discussed all of the merits of the projects and which ones um, qualitatively were either more in need or would have more of an impact on the public. Um, unfortunately, that that small amount of funding that we have available compared to the, the request that we had means projects that I think both the departments and the public would deem as high priority still weren't able to necessarily make the cut um, just because we, we had to cut, you know, uh, about 75% of the projects that were requested. Is that the reason the uh, soccer field <laughs> in Ramsey Park is low priority? Well, I think if you're, which page are you looking at? 28. 
Yeah, so 228 is, is in the grouping of projects that are still unfunded. As I mentioned, the unfunded projects are still in this booklet and they're in the back. So starting on page 196 is where you're seeing the descriptions of the unfunded projects. But so well anything a department but, but voluntarily but rated as a low priority kind of automatically became unfunded. Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. Why would it be low priority if it would service, you know, a, you know, a lot of the population versus a small little park? that is just gonna, you know, service as, you know, a little neighborhood. Well, if you're looking at page 197, the Arista Park playground, that's also unfunded. So both but, uh, but I mean, priority-wise, it's high priority, so you would go to that one first, because this one's, uh, the Ramsey Park soccer field's a lower priority. If, if more funding becomes available, um, if more general fund becomes available, we will make decisions on what to fund, not necessarily based on the rankings here. We actually will go back to the committee and let the committee decide again. Uh, because these rankings, the rankings that were initially submitted were pretty arbitrary. And so we would we would call the committee back together to re review and re-look at the requests. Other questions or comments? Go ahead. So I just wanted to ask, I know a couple years ago, the situation with the uh, the piping in the in the city was extremely poor. The some of our piping was a hundred years old and that type of situation. So I notice it's being funded, but just real quick, is that still a, a major area of concern for the city in terms of our our? Uh, I guess it's our water. I don't I don't know if it's our sewer, but has that been caught up a little bit? Is that something that we use as a priority for? Replacement. I notice there's quite a bit of money going to that department. I don't know if that's what it's for, but um, that would be my question. Have we improved on that in the last few years? That's been the, um, the goal of the department, uh, Public Works and the Water Department. They have um, yearly goals, and so it's uh, right now the goal is two miles per year, and so they're working on that. And as if you go through Marchant Street, that's one of the areas that they're working on right now, Marchant and Maple. So yes, they are working on meeting that goal of um, two miles per year. I know this is not a trick we'll question, take. but <laughs> how many miles about do we have? I believe we have 70 miles, so it's gonna take, um, five years. It's gonna take about 35 years if we do the two miles per right. year. I gotcha. But, but we have conditions that, you know, a couple of years ago we have weather conditions that might right. not do you prioritize by the area or do you prioritize by the age of the pipes? Meaning are you going through neighborhoods or are you actually identifying those pipes that are 100 years old that are the, the most dangerous or the most likely to? Yeah, I believe there was an assessment done and so okay. it was based on aging, so but also there's, there's certain areas that they just happen to, you know, they have been um, water main breaks that they yeah. need to, going from the main project of, um, replacing those pipes to going to an emergency one where they have to, so that's another factor that will. Gotcha. Okay, perfect, thank you. Other questions? I have a clarification question. Um, the, okay, can you clarify the difference between the gas tax and the SB1 gas tax? I, I think, I know what the SB1 is, but the gas tax, is that a local one? What is that? You have two on here, so what's the? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Maria Esther Rodriguez, Assistant Director of Public Works. The, the gas tax um, and SB1 are very interrelated. However, as you, as you may be aware, the SB1 funding, although it's, it's essentially an, it was an increase in gas tax over this that happened started, starting this last year, we started getting those funds, and the reason why they're separated is because I think the SB1, as you may know, is is up for debate at this current time, and you may see some be seeing something on your ballot. But uh, gas tax is something historically we've been receiving um, for years to fund transportation-related improvements and maintenance on our roadways, and that part's not going away. Um, or, and we hope SB1 doesn't go away either because that is a significant amount of money. It's also almost uh, doubled our gas tax and what we can do for maintenance of our roadways. 
Yeah, I've noticed it's um, the SB1 funds in, in every project that's related to roads or any kind of transportation is, is huge. It's uh, the, the amount of money is significant. Yes. <laughs> I also wanted to um, just point out that, um, and thank you for the, uh, the rail tail from the rail trail funding from Walker Street down to Lee Road. So I see that's in here. And um, it seems like there are lots of improvements coming to Ramsey Park, which is what much needed because Ramsey Park is much used and in need. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we can move now to the public hearing for this item agenda. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak on the capital improvement projects? Seeing none, I bring it back to the commission. Are there any other questions for the staff? Would somebody like to make a motion? Make a motion that we accept the, the report as provided by the staff. Uh, do we hear a second to the motion that we accept the capital improvement program? I'll second. So the motion has been made and seconded to adopt the uh, capital improvement program. Uh, can we have roll call, please? Dana? Yes. Jones? Yes. Montesino? Yes. Sarmiento? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. Rivera? Yes. Hammer? Yes. So the motion has been carried unanimously. Um, Next, we will move to item 5B, which is a public hearing to consider an application for a special use permit with environmental review, PP 2018-89, to allow the, oh no, sorry, that's the wrong one. <laughs> sorry about that, kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> item C. Um, item C, public hearing, my apologies to the translator, sorry. <laughs> um, item 5C, we're moving to item 5C, which is at the back of your um, agenda. So item 5C is a public hearing to consider planning commission recommendation to the city council on an environmental impact report, a general plan map amendment, a rezoning, a planned development overlay district, a major subdivision, the tentative map, special use permit with design review, PP 2016-99 and PP 2017-116, to allow the construction of 150 dwelling units consisting of 23 single family units, 40 duplex style townhome units, and 87 row style townhome units on a 13 more or less acre site located at 511 Ohlone Parkway. This is uh, lot number APN 01-372-14 and also number 018-381-01 and it's being filed by California Sunshine Development LLC applicant and property owner. Um, may we begin with the staff report, please? Good evening, Commissioner Kramer, West of Planning Commission and the public. I'm Justin Meek, Principal Planner for the City of Watsonville, and I'll be giving you the staff report. By way of an overview, I'll touch on the background of the site as well as the process or the entitlements that you'll be providing a recommendation to council on. Uh, with that, I'll touch on again the project location, the past uses, surrounding uses, what the project entails, and then go into some of the entitlements, such as the general plan land use designation change and rezoning, along with a plan development overlay for this particular project to accommodate the type of development that's being proposed. There are, as part of the plan development, there's some proposed modification to the district regulations, and I'll highlight which ones those are, as well as w which ones aren't being changed. Uh, following that, I'll touch on the design conformity with the city's livable communities residential design guidelines and how it 
conforms to many of the city's principles and objectives of said guidelines. Finally, uh, this project has been evaluated per CEQA, an environmental impact report has been prepared, and I'll uh, uh, relay the key findings of that report. So as a recap, there are several entitlements that are required. First and foremost, there's the environmental review and the city council will need to certify the EIR and adopt a mitigation monitoring plan for this project and then approve with a series of resolutions and or ordinances the general plan map amendment, rezoning to residential, a plan development overlay district along with a tentative map for the major subdivision of the site into 150 lots and six common areas along with a special use permit which is required because of the plan development and with design review and a specific development plan again which is also a requirement and tied to the plan development. This particular site as many of you are aware is referred to as clusters it has been in operation or had been in operation as a automotive repair facility, but it involved a lot of bodywork, maintenance, service, dismantling and crushing, disposal and even car burning, and of course, storage of waste fluids on site since the 1960s. As illustrated by these photographs, it was uh, in a high state of disrepair, you could say. This aerial photograph shows the site that existed as of 2007. Uh, the area in blue is the primary area that will be um, developed as residential. The, um, there is a little sliver of parcel that's 018-38101 that's also part of the proposed project and I'll highlight that area in the site plan in just a moment. You'll note that there was a number of vehicles and buildings that formerly were on site as a first phase of the project that involves some site cleanup, all of the surface debris and structures have been removed as they were found categorically exempt. So now moving on with the proposed project for the construction of the residential component, it involves 150 units on individual lots, 23 of which would be in single family homes, and then there'll be a series of duplex and row style townhouses. Houses. Altogether, the proposed density for this project is 17.5 acres, which is why, as part of the general plan map amendment, it would be rezoned from <coughs> industrial to residential high density, because that's the appropriate land use category. With this development, there are new roads, parking, common space, common open spaces, utilities, stormwater management facilities, and an extension of a nature trail, as shown here on the proposed site plan. The single family homes are in the northern and eastern side of the property facing Watsonville Slough, but outside of a 50 foot riparian setback area. Duplex style units are along the southern boundary of the property and on across the street of Street A. And in between these units are the row style uh, townhomes. There is single car garages for each one of these, uh, these housing units and then surface streets parking on street, parallel and perpendicular to the streets surrounding the site. As I mentioned before, there's a trail extension. So in the southern corner, next to the Sunshine Gardens project site, which is under construction, a trail will be extended that will wrap around the site and over to the Seagrew Ranch project area. You'll see that there's a condition of approval or that requires an easement for a future trail extension across at the sewer line as a potential connection across to um, the trail that's next to the Blackbird site and leading to Ramsey Park. This area over here, this identified as a bird watching area, which also involves a more site cleanup, is in that adjoining property that I mentioned previously. Throughout the site, there will be landscaping and open space areas interconnected with pathways, either on sidewalks or paths that lead to the townhome units and have appropriate crossings of the street to ensure it meets ADA compliance. This, this is just a 
quick table just to highlight the specifics that the single family units are two stories, whereas the duplex and row style units are three and a little bit taller from 26 to approximately 35 feet in height. The floor areas also range from a low for some of the row style units of approximately 1,000 square feet to close to 2,000 square feet for the single family homes. And these particular <coughs> residential developments would be on lots that range from approximately 700 square feet, again, for the row style, to approximately 4,000 square feet for the largest of the single family, all of which are, of course, less than the minimum lot size for this particular district. Some of the common open space areas will have programming for all age groups, including children's play areas, as well as bocce ball courts. There are some observation areas and a deck and patio that will have tables and chairs and benching to overlook the Watsonville Slough and the trail below. And this is just an artistic rendering of what the play area in the central portion of the project site where you can see in the distance the play structure and it's kind of hard to see, but the bocce ball court beyond. Here's a plan view showing these same areas. On the left-hand side is the central to common open space area connected with textured asphalt paving, which will also serve as a traffic calming measure for vehicles accessing that narrow alleyway leading to the garages of the row house style units along that street. And on to the right are plan views of the deck, observation deck on, the, on top, and the observation patio area to below. And these areas border the single family residential areas in, within the site plan. The following are a series of floor plans showing each housing unit type. So this is for unit A. It's a two story single family home with a two car garage. You can see that there's three bedrooms above as well as a deck and patio area as part of this floor plan. For unit B, there's only one of this style. It's a slightly larger housing type, also has a two-car garage, three bedrooms, and so forth. This is one of the affordable units that's being proposed. This is considered unit J. It's, again, within the single-family uh, lot area. Similar to the others, it, all of these, as I mentioned before, have two-car garages. This one is a three-bedroom unit, but overall a slightly smaller floor area. The duplex style units, there are two general styles, C and D. Uh, you'll see that with many of these, they will have the two-car garage in tandem, so as to minimize the amount of the garage facing the street and also to fit it onto the lot. You'll find that in some cases, you have a bedroom on the ground floor, and two above, but there'll be slightly different configurations as we scroll through these. Similar, s similar to C1 and C2. Again, note that there are patio and deck areas with this, as well as room for all trash enclosures, whether it's in the garage or in this case, an adjoining shed-like structure attached to, or storage-like structure attached to the unit itself. Again, here's an example of one of the affordable units in the duplex style. And I didn't mention before, but in the site plan, the areas which are right now identified for affordable units were the ones that were in this slight yellowish color to help distinguish between the two. Moving on to the row style. In this case, the residential units are typically above, none are on the ground floor. Usually we have open floor plan seating and kitchen in the second floor and the attached deck is typically either on the second or third floor of these units. This is an example of one with just two bedrooms. Where, and this one actually does have, excuse me, this one does have uh, an additional unit on the ground floor with two bedrooms on the third floor. As I mentioned before, all of them do have private patios. And you can see the affordable units are a little bit on the smaller side. This one in particular has two bedrooms. I 
I mainly want to have them up here as a point of reference in case we need to come back to them, but of course, they're also in the packet. We see slight variations on the general styles of units, whether single family, duplex, or row style. Here are some elevations and renderings to give you a better sense of what they're going to look like once they're constructed. And, you'll and also highlighting what kind of materials are being proposed. So we have asphalt composite shingle si roofing for each of these units, along with some plaster and cement siding to help break up the massing and um, the, wa the wall paneling of these particular units. Many of these will have windows that are aluminum clad and or dormers. The materials for the body of the of the of these units are painted wood or synthetic wood trim, and this is an example of unit A. On the left is the front, and th to the right is the rear elevations to get a sense. And as you can see, these are pitch roof units. You can see the wood siding on the upper floor help break up the massing, use some nice trim to help differentiate and make it an aesthetically, uh, aesthetically appealing product. On lot two is an example of unit J, again in the single family, same materials as proposed before, but you can see in this case, the, the garage here extends forward with a, a leading um, balcony area, or that's rather covering to the front door of this particular unit. Moving on to the duplex style units. These are not Duplex units in that they are on a single lot. They are on their own individual lots. They're townhomes, so they look like they're attached, but they're structurally independent of one another. And this is what the perspective renderings would look like for these particular units. And similarly, that was un unit D, and here's one of the unit C types to give you a sense of what this one might look like. And you have the dormer windows to help provide some articulation, break up the look uh, and massing of these particular styles of units. They have coverings over the doors and elevated decks uh, on the rear of these, of those duplex style units. As far as the row style units, these are also townhomes. And you can see there's a series of different unit types that are put in different configurations. I'm not going to show each and every one of them. We'd be here all night. But these were for units F, I, E, and G in that particular order. Same type of materials as with the other proposed units to provide some uniformity and same kind of materials and details throughout. And again, some perspective renderings to see how the units um, punch out and in. So you have not a continuous wall plane, but you have nice articulation, both in the use of the wall surfaces, the decking, windows, and so forth. Again, these are mainly provided just as a representative sample of the various styles. They also, as part of the project, there is proposed landscaping that is appropriate both for the residential component as well as the native landscaping around the rain garden and nature trail. It involves a nice plant palette, uh, but before I get to that, um, next to the residential, you know, or in between the slough and the residential component, there's the Rain gardens, which is a drainage feature to control stormwater runoff. You can see in this area here the sort of general idea of the type of plantings that would be here, which will also help screen the retaining wall, which in some places will reach up to 13 feet in height. Then a sloped surface to a, a smaller retaining wall that leads to the backyards of some of the single family homes <coughs> and the type of plantings that would be provided in those areas as well. As I was about to say, here's an example of the types of plant pallet that would be included throughout the development sites, everything from coast like oak to, um, to, God, I can't read this, <laughs> but um, flowering plums and, and the like, Abutus marina and other types of trees that would be provided as tree seeds or accents. 
And then shrubs, ornamental vines, uh, grasses, and perennials of various types would be provided throughout the landscaped areas of the units, next to the retaining walls, at the entries to the sites, which are highlighted in some of the typical front yard sections, which are provided as part of the packet. A little hard to read here, of course, but I just want to bring it to everyone's attention. In terms of now the required land use changes to this for this projection of project to move forward, there's a general plan change of the, of the land use diagram as well as rezoning the site. The general plan land use diagram would be changed from residential to high density, and this would allow the densities of between 14 and 36 units per acre. That's what's permitted in that particular category. And since the project is at 17.5, that's the appropriate land use category. And then in terms of zoning, it's presently zoned in general industrial. And to again, to have a consistent zoning with the general plan, it would be changed to RM3. And at the request of the applicant to provide the small lot development at this particular density, with that rezoning would be a plan development overlay district. I should note that none of the areas identified as environmental management management would change their designation. Here's the, the existing land use diagram and how it would change. So that darker color represents high density residential. And similarly, the zoning would change to RM3 with the overlay district. The, as you note, there's other communities in the general vicinity that also have an overlay, PD overlay district applied to them as well. The draft findings in support of this rezoning and general plan land use change are included in Exhibit A. And in it, if it finds that the amendments are consistent with the policies in the, in the general plan, which are provided in great detail. And I'm not going to list them here, but if you have any questions, we can go over them, as well as compatible with existing residential developments, as well as the planned um, adjacent properties for residential use. As I indicated before, the, as part of a plan of development, there's the option to request for modification of subdivision as well as zoning standards. And this is one technique that's used to help foster plans that better serve public objectives. So in this case, the small lots with the detached single family houses and duplex and row style townhouses require a modification request, otherwise they would not be permitted in this configuration or at this density. It also allows for the clustering of the development away from the riparian area nearby. Some of the justifications for this plan development is that the proposed open space is greater than the minimum requirement and that there's amenities for all age groups, including, as I mentioned before, the children's play apparatus, basketball court, picnic and overlook areas. There's an additional bird watching area for the portion of that little knob area that extends into the slough that can be turned into a bird watching. The applicant will be providing a trail extension that would go around the entire project site and connect the two adjoining residential neighborhoods. Site cleanup is another public benefit that comes with this proposed project. Obviously, a, a automatic dismounting place has a lot of contamination that would need to be cleaned up if the site is to be habitable. The, because of the PD and the way in which they configure the site with small lots, they're maximizing the developable land area and, pr and providing a, a good range of housing types, which because they're providing more housing units and because of the inclusionary housing requirements of the city affords a greater number of inclusionary housing units at the same time. The proposed modifications to the underlying RM3 district standards relate to the lot size, coverage, frontage, as well as front, side, and rear setbacks. As attachment four, there is a detailed summary of all the by individual lot of whether or not any particular lot is in compliance with those or require modification to allow its development. Proposed projects also involved, or excuse me, the proposed modifications also involved uh, two street widths that are narrower than the city standards. The only one that meets the current city standard is the access 
Road that would be the extension off of Loma Vista. That meets the current standard, but within the project site, there would be smaller or narrower roadways so as to make the project more land efficient, provide more room for the housing, as well as less impervious services that generate runoff. Along these roads, except for Street B, there will be on-street parking. The on-street parking are the ones that are parallel to the street, what we consider off-street or perpendicular parking spaces are shown in this configuration. There's, uh, and I'll touch on this in just a moment, a greater number of guest parking spaces than the minimum standard, and they're distributed throughout the entire site. These two images just provide an ex example on streets A and C of the two different types of parking spaces that will be provided. The particular requirements of the city for residential developments that don't require modification include the provisions about minimum net land area. The proposed project exceeds the minimum net, net, net land area based off the number of units and bedrooms. Also, the parking. The amount of parking that's been proposed is totally uh, 411 spaces, 300 of which would be in private garages. And then they're proposing twice the number of guest parking spaces. Based off of the city's standards, a project of this size would require approximately 55 guest parking spaces, and they're proposing one, 111 guest parking spaces distributed throughout the site. The open space requirements also are satisfied. As I mentioned before, each and every of the units has either a deck or patio area that is at or exceeds 96 square feet of space, which is the minimum requirement, and the remaining amount can be in common, and that area also exceeds the remaining amount of 104 for a total of 200 square feet per unit. And th again, those are distributed in th four areas, the two centrally located areas and the two observation deck and patio areas. And this is to highlight how those, these particular units conform. The project also conforms with the Livable Communities Residential Design Guidelines in that it helps it, the proposed design reflects traditional neighborhood characteristics with historic styles, small yards, and, and front yard porches. The parking is distributed throughout the site and is unobtrusive, particularly for the row style homes, which have alleyway access and no parking in the front of the units. The building facades are in general well composed, balanced, and have nice articulation. All the corner facing units have facades that enhance both sides of the street. They, all the units use the same general forms, details, and high quality materials, and are aesthetically pleasing and harmonious throughout. As I mentioned previously, the massing of the walls are well broken by balconies, dormer windows, and building offsets. The project also involves pedestrian scale lighting. There's a city park, um, parkland requirement. While the proposed uh, project does not include a public park, they will, the app developer will be paying an in-lieu fee in the amount equal to the value of land prescribed in section 3-6.604 of the city's municipal codes. And these fees will be used for providing parks and recreational facilities off-site. Per the EIR, and to enhance the riparian area, 93 non-native trees, mostly the tall eucalyptic trees that you can see in the lower left-hand corner of the image, will be removed. This is intended to restore and enhance the riparian habitat. As part of the mitigation measure, there's tree plantings with native plantings of willows. And those will grow, and as they grow and mature, they'll reach approximately 30 feet and will eventually help screen the site as it is currently screened by the taller eucalyptus trees. The site uh, is subject to the city's post-construction stormwater management requirements. To comply with those requirements, the applicant has proposed two rain gardens that are beyond the retaining walls and, in and um, just shy of the proposed nature trail extension. There's also some low-lying catchment areas, in particular at the other ends of the row-style houses and permeable pavers 
are proposed on street in the parking areas to help reduce the amount of impervious surfaces and runoff that results from it. And this is just to show the, here's the smaller of the two main rain gardens that are fed into from stormwater that's caught in the residential proposed, residential portion. Engineering staff has reviewed and found that the preliminary plans meet the city standards. This project w underwent environmental review. A draft EIR was prepared. It identified no significant impacts uh, that are unavoidable. While there were some potential impacts to biological resources, cultural and tribal resources, geology and soils, hydrology and water quality, noise and traffic, while they were found potentially significant, all are mitigable to a less than significant level, and those mitigation measures were also included in the packet in detail in case you have questions concerning them. During the public review period that occurred between February 5th and March 31st of this year, we had the following commentators. They, based off of those commentators, no new significant issues were identified and some minor changes were provided as part of the final EIR shown in underlying text and strike through. So in conclusion, the proposed project will allow construction of 150 units on individual lots consisting of single family duplex style townhouses and row style townhouses. They're compatible with existing and planned residential neighbors in the, in the adjacent properties, in particular Seaview Ranch and the Sunshine Gardens project sites. Uh, it, it meets the intent of the general plan's goals and policies as outlined in the staff report and including the attached findings. It will utilize, and of course this, to facilitate this project, will utilize the city's municipal code regarding plan developments to allow modifications to subdivision and zoning district development standards, which are justified to serve public adjustment more fully than development plans permitted under conventional zoning regulations. The design adheres to many of the principles and objectives of the city's livable communities residential design guidelines, including, but not limited to, the creating a new subdivision to be land efficient with narrow residential streets, attached row style houses on small lots with alley access, houses with front porches facing the street, centrally located common open spaces, and a variety, excuse me for the misspelling, of housing types and architectural styles. As condition, the Planning Commission may make the findings in support of the proposed project to, to, for the following entitlements. And, uh, and staff recommends that uh, they adopt this resolution to make a recommendation to Council to approve the project entitlements subject to findings and conditions. There are a few clarifications to some of the conditions I'd like to go over before I conclude my staff report. Uh, there was a question about the applicability of the California Building Code, and so uh, I want to read on the record these proposed changes to condition number 18 under the tentative map conditions that the project construction shall comply with all applicable provisions of Title 24 of the California Code of Regulations, such as the latest versions of the California Residential Code, and that will be the subject of the building division to administer. I also want to add a new condition. We had expected and thought that there was a stop sign at the end of Street A or Loma Vista as you come down the hill before you get to Parizo Court and Del Rio Court. So this is just a condition to assure that a stop sign is put on that westbound approach to that area. And the about the, uh, the applicant has also indicated their in interest in entering into a development agreement for this project. So we added the following condition that upon request by the applicant, they may enter into a development agreement with the city in a form acceptable to the city uh, community development director and city attorney, and as approved by the city council by ordinance to provide at a minimum, among other specifics, the following details. As to the project phasing, including the filing of up to four final maps, the construction of project infrastructure improvements, provision of affordable housing within the phases of the, the project, the scheduling of payment to the city of project fees over the course of the phasing of the project, the timing of the development, 
and vesting of development rights, particulars as to project requirements, dedications and exactions, off-site improvements, open space requirements, project review, and such other particulars <coughs> as the applicant and the city agree upon as being relevant to the certainty as to the continuity of the project and applicable laws and requirements. I should note that there are some statutory extensions that the applicant has raised as to the time frame for this particular project, that there are specific government code sections that, for example, 6654.1, the applicant is entitled to file multiple final maps uh, relating to the approved or conditionally approved tenant map and that may be filed prior to the expiration of said tenant map. There's also provisions that speak to a tenant map may be extended for maps subject to requirements to construct certain offsite improvements pursuant to section 6645.2.6. Any of these will, however, the uh, right of the subdivider to file multiple tenants shall not limit the authority of the local agency to impose reasonable conditions relating to the filing of multiple filing maps. And with that, I'd like to conclude and open it up. I know the project applicants would also like to give a presentation too, much of it was already included in the staff report, I believe as attachment number nine. Yes, so um, with that, I'd like to turn it over, I think to Peter, who wish, wishes to address the commission. Okay, Do, should we wait for commission questions and then go to? Commission questions for staff, and then you can do either. I'd probably recommend waiting for the um, the applicant, the applicant okay. to do their presentation. Right. Um, then we will go to the applicant presentation. Um, could you please step forward? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cameron. My name is Peter Silva. I'm an architect with Walt Brunke and Dost Architects in Monterey. Um, this has been a very exciting project for us. Um, I have other members of the project team with me, including our civil engineers, our environmental consultant, traffic consultant. Uh, I think our landscape architect is going to show up a little late. He had another appointment, but he should be here in the event that there's any questions for the team. Um, and last but not least, we have the owner of the project, Lisa Lee, uh, sitting right there beside me. And uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, fair to say that Lisa's commitment to this project is just 100%, 110%. She is um, active in Watsonville community. She's not an outside, out-of-town developer. She has a vested interest in making uh, and shaping Watsonville's future in a very positive manner. And I think that after I'm done with this short presentation, uh, you will hopefully agree that uh, the efforts that Lisa and everyone on the team uh, put into this project will certainly uh, contribute towards um, the betterment of Watsonville. So with that, um, I put together a PowerPoint presentation um, about a month ago and presented that to the neighbors as a neighborhood outreach. And it turned out to be about an hour long. So I didn't want to burden you. It's already 7.30 with an hour long presentation. So I decided to make uh, a hard copy version of it, which I believe Justin mentioned uh, is uh, attached to your packet there. And so uh, that's going to really have most of what I would have said tonight, but just in a written form with a lot of pretty pictures. Uh, I do, however, want to just focus on the last section of that PowerPoint presentation, which speaks towards the project benefits. Now, Justin has already talked a lot about benefits on the project as they relate. That's it. Yes. Yes. So Justin has already talked a lot about benefits as they relate and uh, justify the plan development uh, process. But um, when I think about project benefits on this project, I don't categorize the benefits uh, in a laundry list. I think the entire project is a benefit to Watsonville. And yeah, we can go and dissect and, and, and look at how that happens, and I'll do that. So we have a tremendous amount of resources um, going towards cleaning up this contaminated site. No other outside develop out of town developer would even touch this property. Yet Lisa's commitment to the betterment of Watsonville and her environmental stewardship really shows and it really shines with her commitment towards expending 
a lot of money towards cleaning up this site. Um, we have a very extensive uh, 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 biomitigation plan involved to protect habitat um, and uh, we'll monitor various uh, species that were identified in the EIR during the construction process. Unfortunately, none of these species actually were found on the site when the EIR was prepared because the site has been so contaminated that these animals and plants won't live there. <laughs> but we expect that after we're done with the project, we're going to improve the ecosystem so much that not only is the water quality in the slough going to be vastly superior, but hopefully we'll have the turtles and the frogs and tar plant and nesting birds come back and thrive in this area. So um, one of the um, aspects of the project I think is really beneficial towards Watsonville is the fact that we're providing more housing opportunities. And we're doing that through the plan development permit process, which enables us to create modifications to conventional zoning, as Justin mentioned, to create a more compact site plan. And when we have a compact site plan, we're able to put more units uh, per acre than a conventional zone subdivision. And the benefit of that is really twofold. A, we're stabilizing housing prices by putting more houses on the market. Uh, and B, we're creating more opportunities for affordable housing. Conventional zoning on this site would allow for perhaps 13 affordable homes, and yet we're provide, providing 30 affordable homes. And um, inside the, the uh, PowerPoint hard copy there, there's one slide that I thought was particularly interesting, which was a uh, copy of a headline from uh, an online news site which said that Santa Cruz County ranks as the fourth least affordable housing market in the world, in the world. And obviously it's a, a supply and demand problem as we all know. And so trying to take advantage of the planned development uh, process and creating a smart development with clustered houses away from the ecosystem, creating more open space than is normally required, creating a high quality project with design amenities that you don't normally see in these types of subdivisions. Um, we're going to have the uh, houses uh, reflect a very traditional uh, neighborhood aesthetic that's perfectly consistent with the goals and objectives of the Watsonville Neighborhood Design Guidelines. We have uh, authentic detailing. Um, we're, uh, have we have different types of houses, and within those types of houses, we have more variety. And so you, when you walk down the sidewalk or drive your car down the street, it's not going to be cookie cutter. It's going to be a lot of variety. Um, and um, we put a lot of effort into making sure that this project, design-wise, was going to be a step above and really set the bar for Watsonville in terms of its overall design quality. Um, we have as Justin mentioned, twice the number of guest parking. We certainly don't want to impact Seaview Ranch. That's already bad enough. If you drive down Seaview Ranch, the streets are narrow, and every time I go down there, there's never anywhere to park. We don't want to duplicate that mistake. So we're providing twice as much parking get for guests than is normally required. Um, we're providing, a, uh, as me Justin mentioned, uh, an extension to the trail, 1,500 foot long extension to the trail, no cost to taxpayers. Um, each home has their own private usable open space um, and we have a top notch landscape architect who put together a beautiful landscape plan and we're putting a lot of resources into making sure that we have seasonal color, drought tolerant plant species so that it's going to be absolutely beautiful and a real asset towards the neighborhood. Uh, in terms of neighborhood protection, um, the EIR demonstrated that there's very little scenic impacts uh, from the project uh, as one would be driving down Highway 1, for instance, or Ford Street, for instance, or Harkinslew Road, for instance. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, mitigations for construction noise, uh, which will entail the building of an acoustical fence and this is a very elaborate process that we're doing that you hardly see in other types of subdivisions as they're being constructed. We're going to hire an acoustical engineer 
to properly design this fence so that the neighbors are going to be buffered from construction noise. Construction traffic is going to be diverted away from Landmark School, away from Main Street, and go south towards West Beach. Um, there's going to be a flagger during construction. Um, and furthermore, for, for uh, dealing with additional traffic impacts that the EIR identified, we're going to be doing a new right turn signal phase on the eastbound main as it goes uh, eastbound onto Ohlone. And we're also doing new signal timing at Green Valley in Maine. Um, Lisa is, is contributing a very significant financial resource into this project, most of which will probably not be captured. I mean, the amount of money that's going to go towards the environmental restoration um, is money that most other large subdivision developers would never even do. And that's why this project has been an auto wrecking yard for 50 years, and it hasn't been looked at seriously for uh, subdividing until Lisa stepped up to the plate. She's providing a significant financial resource into the school system at an estimated $1.25 million to the school district and about $650,000 for off-site improvements for the Parks Department. So in short, we have a team that is really committed to the success of this project. We believe in Watsonville's future, and we believe that this project is truly a showcase for expanding housing in a way that not only protects the environment and enhances the neighborhood, but it really sets a new bar for how Watsonville should be developing these types of subdivisions in the future. Um, and with that, I'd like to just, uh, in closing, mention one thing that Justin touched upon, which is the mapping and the, and the phasing of the project. We're looking at not building this out um, in th three years, but perhaps as much, maybe five to six years. We have di discovered that it's financially infeasible to just quickly do all of this uh, infrastructure and build out in one phase. And so that's why we have uh, decided to do multiple final maps uh, with the intent of spreading the construction build out over a period of perhaps five years. And uh, so with that, um, I'm available for uh, answering any of your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I guess we'll go to questions from the commission for the applicant and for staff, and then after that we'll move to the public hearing where the public can make comment. Um, so let's start with questions for uh, staff or the applicant. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Montesine. Question for you, was there, so was there any consideration, because I'm, I'm looking um, through all the, mass. first of all, it looks like a great project, you know. Thank um, you. I don't like the five-year phase, but okay, you know. Um, a consideration of a, um, a light that stops on an Ohlone, because there's already traffic issues on, uh, on a, I used to represent that area and I always get, you know, um, uh, people couldn't get out from the um, CB Ranch area, people can get, get out um, because of the traffic. So is there any consideration to speed bumps, any consideration to stops on San Ohlone? Because um, uh, all the other enhancements look, you know, great, you know, of what you're talking about, but, um, you know, um, that amount of cars that are going to be, you know, packed in there, there's going to be a lot of, you know, friction. Um, and we only have one crosswalk guard there for Landmark School, but it's only for a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the evening. So, I, um, well, um, is, thank you. That's a is good that the question. direction for the applicant or for staff? Both. I, I mean, was there any, a, a, you know? Well, let me let me take it first stab at this. And I'm going to preface this by saying you probably won't be satisfied with my answer. But if you look at the traffic study and the section in the EIR that addresses project-related traffic impacts, Loney and Loma Vista was looked at. Its current operations, I believe, are A and B, which means that from a traffic impact standard, Wait, Justin, can I stop you for a second? Um, yeah. So that information is in the EIR and it is on page 365 360 well there's table 37 yeah three yeah but there's also yeah 354 
365. Yeah, so it's in this EIR. Is there only one copy? So, yeah. so that is okay. correct. The text that describes the impacts, the existing conditions, and the project-related impacts are on those pages. I just want to bring your attention to this particular table because it just, in summary, provides the analysis. And so for that particular intersection, let me refresh my memory as to which one it is. I believe it's intersection three. And under existing conditions, the Ohlone segment is operating at LOSA, which is the best that category from a level of service. Excuse me, LOS stands for level of service. It's a traffic engineering term for the amount of free flowing traffic or congestion along a particular roadway. And the side streets appears to be operating at C and B. So there's a little bit more congestion, as you would expect, getting on and off the streets. But along Ohlone, it moves forward. As you, as you mentioned, there's no stop control at that intersection. And those trying to get on in the peak periods in the morning and, and afternoons have a little bit of a delay. The city's thresholds for significance is LOSD. And so when the analysis was conducted, the project contribution did not trigger that this intersection would operate at LOSD and therefore warrant uh, any improvements to the site. So that's, that's the reason why you're not seeing any proposed mitigation measures per the EIR for this particular segment. Having said this, um, the applicant informed me that during the community event that they attended, the issue of traffic at this intersection was raised and asked that I draft a potential mitigation measure, or excuse me, condition of approval, um, that could look at a subsequent study of that intersection at a future day to see after the project is constructed whether the amount of traffic generated warrants any street improvements at the intersection. And if you like, I could show you that particular language. That would that would be great because I know uh, you know especially uh, with that community. So uh, you know, um, like you said, it's very free flowing on Ohlone, but just to get into Ohlone from uh, um, um, from uh, both sides of the development is is pretty unique, so especially when uh, um, school uh, the school site is uh, is on, and it's only like you know sure. certain periods. Um, so, and here's the language, and it's within your purview to accept or modify this language, if you so choose. The applicant shall conduct a traffic study for the intersection of Ohlone Parkway and Loma Vista Drive following project construction, and once at least 80% of all housing units, i.e. 120 units, are occupied by homeowners and or renters. If the OHOA has been established at this time, it shall be res responsible for hiring a qualified transportation consulting firm or individual to conduct the traffic study. The traffic study shall evaluate traffic conditions at th this study intersection during both a.m. and p.m. peak hours of a typical weekday. <coughs> intersection turning movements, counts for vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians shall be collected and compared with the existing plus project conditions provided in the draft TIR for the project, see table 37. If project generated traffic is gen determined to be to contribute to the intersection operating at LOS D, E, or F, the applicant, or HOA if established, shall provide the proportional fair share of the cost of implementing improvements to mitigate the impact to the intersection as identified in the traffic study and found to be warranted by the city engineer. Pretty good. Thank you. Other questions? Um, let's start here and then go that way since we started there. So, um, Commissioner I Rivera. Sorry, I'm go sorry. ahead. Mine is just a follow up to okay. Montesinos. Yeah, go ahead. If, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah go Thank ahead. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as a resident of that area, um, you know, waiting for uh, another study and mitigation to the traffic in five years, you know, so. I, I love the project. I think it's great. We need housing. We need affordable housing. But really, the impact on that community when it comes to traffic is is really unbearable because most of the people who uh, live in that area work over the hill. So in the morning, everybody is leaving at the same time between 6 and 7 o'clock and you, you, know, you can already tell people are aggravated 
Nobody wants to let you in. It's really challenging. So for the community to experience this, for five years to be able to decide, and I don't understand how the studies are done, but you have to experience it and live it there to understand that it is a major impact. I, and I'm really concerned also that there's only one entry and exit point um, into the development. Uh, so all the traffic comes out to Ohlone Parkway. Um, I don't see how, if there's anything else that we can do to make it um, better um, so residents are not impacted by this. I mean, I'm, I'm for the project, but. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Sarmiento, uh, we do have our traffic consultant that could shed more light on this very issue. I know that it was uh, very imp uh, important for the neighbors when we did our outreach. Uh, and so we'd like to have Chris uh, come up and, and speak towards this. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chairman and Commissioner. My name is Chris Kinzel. I'm a traffic engineer with TJKM Transportation Consultants. Uh, we're located in Pleasanton and San Jose. Uh, we didn't uh, prepare the traffic study. That was done uh, uh, for the city's environmental uh, document. I did review it and am somewhat familiar with it and am uh, uh, familiar with the, uh, what the study says about that intersection. And as was pointed out, the uh, intersection uh, currently satisfies city standards in terms of level of service and delay to the uh, traffic on the side street. And with the, in, with the uh, project traffic from the uh, additional units, the uh, delay to the side street would increase, but still at acceptable levels in terms of delay. Uh, the, the delay to people on Ohlone uh, is, uh, is minimal because it's, there's not a stop sign there. The, uh, the, the new residents from the development would be the ones that experience most of the delay. Uh, so um, there are the, the options available conceivably could be the installation of a stop signs for Ohlone, which would allow for breaks in traffic, uh, so make a four-way stop. Uh, um, the downside of that is that would uh, create uh, more blockage on Ohlone. It would uh, allow uh, traffic to uh, enter Ohlone from the side streets. Um, better opportunity to do that. And the downside would be a little more delay um, on for Ohlone traffic itself. I understand that's uh, a pretty congested area in the morning, particularly, and uh, when the school peak and the and the uh, commute peak uh, occur similarly. And school is not at 6 a.m. It's really closer to 8, uh, 8 39 in that area. But so those are the options that uh, might be available. Can we, if if you guys don't mind, can we stay on this topic for a? a little bit and then um, while we have the people to answer the questions, would that be okay with everybody? N d did you, uh, Commissioner Rivera, did you have a question about traffic? No, it's all about traffic. Is, is, is that? I just had one quick question. I, uh, I'm always confused when you say an acceptable delay because none of us have an idea as laymen what that means. Does that mean I'm at Ohlone in that corner for 10 minutes? Five minutes, fifteen minutes. What, what, what do we consider, or what do they consider reasonable for the residents to be able to make that that intersection? In the the, the, the uh, delay on uh, to um, the average delay to motorists uh, at a stop sign uh, before it would become unacceptable would be probably thirty to forty-five seconds, something in that range. So it's not minutes; it's uh, seconds. Gotcha. Uh, under okay. a minute. We're yeah. not backed up on that street type of thing. You're, you're talking 35, 40 seconds. That's not very bad. 
Correct. And if I may, the, the standards, the thresholds are provided in Table 33 on page 351. That lifts the level of service and associated delay. I think I made it to 350. Sorry. I, I, <laughs> I, I understand. It's a long document. <laughs> Other questions about traffic? Uh, well, I, I, I just got to follow up. So do we have an authority to recommend a, um, um, a stop sign to the city? I'm going to defer that question to Susie. I might actually um, ask our city um, assistant public works director to come up and speak a little bit to what the city's policies are. The Planning Commission always can make that recommendation. It's going to be the city council that makes the final determination, and our public works department will have to weigh in and, and study that. So thank you, Maria. <laughs> be before you go uh, through, I, I have a, no, I have a question probably for you too. And um, the question that I asked previous to the meeting was about, um, so currently there's a stop sign at uh, Paraiso Court and at Del Rio Court. So th those people coming from the current streets on the side have a stop sign there and then they make the turn onto, um, onto Loma Vista and then onto Ohlone Parkway. So the question I asked was, can there be a stop sign so when people exiting the new development would stop, so it would be a three-way stop, and then people would take turns going to the Loma Vista point. Because conceivably, if you've got 150 households and you've got two people working per household, you've got how many people exiting one exit, and they're all coming out, and people from the two side streets are not going to be able to exit either. So, you know, I agree with Commissioner Sarmiento in that that one exit to me se seems problematic. And so that w is a, I don't know if that's a possibility, so throw it out there. Good evening, Commissioners. Again, Maria Esther Rodriguez. Um, actually, that particular intersection, since you're talking about that right now, uh, <coughs> Dustin did include in his presentation that there is indeed a stop sign going to be included at that particular intersection for the traffic coming down from the new development for that intersection. It was, it was, uh, it looks like there's almost equal amounts of traffic from the side streets as from that street, so that made sense and I believe that's a condition. Back to should there be or would it be a recommendation to install a stop on Ohlone and, Lo and Loma Vista? Ohlone Parkway carries a lot more traffic than Loma Vista. That's one of the reasons why you would have a little bit of delay on Loma Vista. But as far as emissions goes and traffic uh, a warrant analysis for a stop sign, I, off the top of my head, I don't think it would warrant a tr uh, stop sign, an always stop, because I'll, actually if you think about it, that's a lot of traffic on Ohlone Parkway, which is a major corridor, versus the minor traffic on the side streets. Um, th I do realize there's going to be times of day that's an inconvenience to get on and off, and it's going to be a little bit difficult, and those are at commute times. But other times of day to have Ohlone traffic stop for every single car that goes by, that's a lot of emissions and a lot of uh, stops that may not be necessary. So I think it, it warrants further analysis and I, while I do recognize that waiting a few years out till it's constructed, uh, uh, that's actually um, not a bad idea just to revisit it to see how it looks <coughs> when it's all constructed and people are living there or at least 80% of it is occupied to look at it and see how that looks. In addition, as a city in general, <coughs> we have to, to do analysis and um, take a look at traffic from time to time. If we see that construction of these developments um, is providing a lot more traffic and it's becoming un, you know, uh, congested and it's beyond the level of service that is allowed by the city of Watsonville, then we do have to look at that. So if uh, my recommendation would be to indeed go with the recommendation of looking at the traffic and analyzing it once there's some construction and some occupancy in that area to see how that, that fares. 
Does that make sense? That sound reasonable? Maria, yes. can you just explain, because I understand with, with public works and, and traffic engineering and planning, when you're talking about when a stop is warranted or warrants, how is that, is that kind of more of a technical term Whereas there has to be a certain volume of traffic or level of service. Can you explain that a little sure. bit more? Um, actually, and it's you, many of you have heard me talking about the manual on uniform traffic control devices, and that's really what we want to go by when we install uh, traffic signal control and what we, we need to go by. That's, that's what's used across the nation when we're looking at traffic signals and traffic's uh, just... Uh, um, and uh, signals and signs and et cetera that's required. Um, so we would look at that and it does indeed take into account things like the volume of traffic, but not only vehicles, but pedestrians and it looks at collisions and it looks at sight distance. So there's a number of factors to look at when you look at a warrant. So looking at all of those things, is it warranted to put a stop sign there? And that's what I would recommend looking at. And I think that traffic study would offer that. Thank you. Do we have other traffic questions? Okay, Commissioner Rivera, we'll move to your question. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more about this five-year or six-year build-out plan. Um, just kind of explain what the reason is for that, just to start. When we started the project, our intent was to or I should say the owner's intent was to do a <coughs> one year, or I'm sorry, about a three year build out, which um, we later determined uh, was not going to be economically feasible. And in fact, that determination wasn't even made known to us until probably two or three weeks ago. And so it, um, it is, unf you know, in the best worlds, we wouldn't want this. Obviously, as an owner who's holding capital for all this time, it's not the best situation uh, from that standpoint either, uh, but uh, it, it became necessary in order to build out the project to phase it. So spreading it out over that period of time, you feel like there's a guarantee, like a, there's a financial guarantee that the project will actually be complete? Uh, well, the, the, uh, the uh, <coughs> conditions that will be set forth in the development agreement which is part of the whole process, uh, will have uh, stipulations about performance and monitoring the project. Um, there could be clauses for yearly monitoring and uh, uh, good faith compliance clauses and so forth, which are typical sections in other development agreements to ensure <coughs> that um, I if for some reason there's an economic downturn or for whatever reason uh, there's a delay in the project, then there's a mechanism for remedy, and that would be in the development agreement. Thank you. That I'm good to hear. Other questions for the applicant or staff? Um, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, so I had a question regarding, um, I guess it's attachment 7, page 31, where it talks about the different impacts um, to, to local services, uh, so police, fire, and schools. Um, the main one I was asked, I was curious about was the 188 school age children projection um, to the local elementary that would be, now it says here, uh, that would potentially overcrowd the existing elementary. And so you had mentioned that the developer was putting in, I, I think the number you used was 1.2 million. Uh, one point, about 1.25 million. To, to earmark to the PVUSD. Um, is that money happening before the projected impact to the elementary school, or is the U school the, district going to have to wait to receive those funds to make? Yeah, the school impact fees uh, are collected at the time that the building permit is being issued. And okay, so, so, so that is relevant to the the required impact fee. So that's the 1.25 million that's That is in. correct, yes. Okay, and then in addition, there's another 600,000 going to the Parks Department. Parkland dedication fee. And that is, but your project scope says that there is not a requirement to build out additional parklands, is that correct? Uh, well, th there's a standard city requirement okay. that projects of this size either contain parkland uh, or there's uh, an in lieu fee that goes towards Got the it. park uh, district so that off-site improvements, acquisition, 
uh, or end maintenance uh, could be accomplished. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Um, Commissioner uh, uh, Sarmiento in Montesino. Uh, Thank you. Um, you're talking about building uh, in different phases. What units will be built first? Uh, well, um, we're still tr trying to um, <laughs> uh, figure out the phasing plan. We, we have a general idea, um, but um, the phasing plan will actually be an exhibit as part of the development agreement. Uh, and there's going to be some back and forth with uh, uh, the owner and the city in terms of answering these types of specific questions. But right now, if you look at the site plan, and Justin, would it be possible to show a slide of the site plan? So we're looking, th the first uh, phase of the build out would be um, about 32 houses that are clustered right around the, 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 the entry to the project. So where Justin is circling his cursor, that's roughly where the first phase will be. And as a follow-up question to that, how many of those units will be affordable housing? I believe we have uh, seven houses in that cluster. So that cluster is approximately how many? I believe it was 31 or 32. 31, and, and I'm sorry, and you said seven? I believe so. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that's my recollection. Okay. Yeah, just but to jump in, as part of the development agreement, these are the things that the city's going to be looking at to make sure the, the right proportion of affordable units are being provided in each of the phases that we have, all of the infrastructure in place for each of the phases, the um, right proportion of the, the, the park and open space so that if for some reason the rest of the project didn't get built for a certain period of time, we'd still have a cohesive and compliant uh, project out there. But that all those details are going to be worked out as part of the development agreement, which will have to go to council for approval. Okay, with those agreements? Yes. Okay. Um, Two more questions. <laughs> um, since the project will be built uh, in five different phases. Four phases. Four phases, I'm sorry. Um, I know as, at least my understanding is that as of 2020, new development will be required to have solar panels. That is correct. So will these units have solar panels uh, built into them? Uh, yeah, we will obviously comply with the state energy code for um, any building permit uh, issuance. And so any uh, portion of the project that's subject to the 2020 California residential code, which we, we'll, as you know, is going to have a requ this particular requirement, yes, we will comply with that. Okay, thank you. The last question now is, is that this, maybe this is more for the city, um, so are we in conversation with the school district um, in regards to how many houses will be built in that area and what the impact will be most likely on Landmark Elementary School? Um, we, the, the school district did receive copies of the EIR and they did uh, respond, they did provide comments to the city regarding that. Um, Legally, the only thing that, that we can do and in, in what the state requires is that the developer pay the required school impact fees, which is meant to offset and provide funding for the school to accommodate any additional children. And I might add that um, the in-lieu fee uh, that uh, Susie just mentioned uh, covers not only project level impacts, but cumulative impacts. That is to say, it's not just impacts from this project. There's Blackbird Homes, there's Sunshine Gardens. And so these fees are calculated in a way to cover cumulative impacts. Of that new development right there off, um, is it Walker? Yes. Along um, the slough, Harkin Slough, right across the street from Ramsey Park. You said we need housing, right? <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Montesino. 
So um, this is a question for the city. So um, I mean, one of the pictures here in my, my handy landy, uh, book reminds me of the pipeline. Is there anything, what is the pipeline, first of all? <coughs> does, it, does it carry anything? And is it going to be more secure so uh, people don't use it as a walkway? Because right now it's... You're talking about the pipeline that crosses the Watsonville Slough? Yeah. So that's the proposed location for a future bridge extension. So that is the intent as outlined in the city's bike and pedestrian master plan to have that serve as a bridge to connect the trails on either side. And so it will formally become a trail connection to accommodate people wanting to go across and not just a dangerous pipeline for people for kids to play on. Great. Thank you. Other questions, Commissioner Rivera? <coughs> this is a this is a small thing, but I did notice it. Um, on your uh, on your map here with the street lights, I noticed that um, in the public spaces there there are no there are no lights there. It looks like is Th that we have uh, not street light. You're talking about the open space areas, yeah? Right. So uh, we don't want to put street lights in the open space areas, but instead we're going to have three foot high bollards that will be illuminated. But because of the scale of that drawing and the tiny size of these bollards, we felt it wasn't necessary that we wanted to just convey the fact that we were going to have enough illumination on the public streets using a traditional pedestrian scaled uh, luminaire. Okay, good. Thank you. Other? Commissioner Dana? The easiest questions of the night. <laughs> so how many, how much footage is there? So you have, I'm looking at the rack area for the kids. And there's, how much space is there for the kids? That little open space. You're talking about the play, the yeah, central play, play area? area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, you have a couple hundred kids coming in, right? Yeah, my recollection, and I don't have the exact number right now, but my recollection was that it was about 6,000 square feet. And okay. they're about six or 7,000 square feet. Yeah, I think those open space area B to the north and C, which has the play apparatus, I think they're both on the order of 5,000 square feet in aggregate. But together they're 10 or together they're 5? So together I think they're closer to 10. The only question that I have is I'm looking at this, you know, kids aren't going to be walking trails. That's really, you have a couple hundred kids there. That's kind of the size of a backyard. Um, at a well, house. I well, mean, what, that's a big backyard, but it's, yeah. it just seems, I don't know if that, to me as a parent, well, an old parent now, that doesn't seem very, I don't see how it, that would work for a couple hundred kids. But, I mean, I'm just curious because you have 150 units here. I mean, was it ever considered maybe to make that area a little bit bigger or was I... Uh, we were pretty well constrained with the infrastructure and the footprint of the units, uh, and we tried to squeeze as much open space as we possibly could with all the leftover negative space on the site. Now, one thing to consider is 200 kids may not be playing there all at one time. Agreed. And furthermore, we analyzed other subdivision projects, like, for instance, Blackbird Homes across the slough has open space that's half the size of this, and that was approved by council. Yeah, but there's, I think there's a little bit more accessibility to, to parks in the area. This is a little bit more isolated in, in that sense from where the parks are at. Th there's, a, there's about a 10 minute walk to Landmark School. I've done it. Yeah, well for a, for a seven year old that may be a problem. The area between the units here, this, the, the, where their yards would be, the back up to each other, do they have any fencing? I, I'm confused about that. Or they, is this just an open space? When you say private patio, does, can I walk out my back door and wave to my neighbor on the other side? Or is there some sort of privacy between the units facing each other in these middle areas? You're talking about the row house? Yes. I'm talking about uh, the area in the center area and the areas that are running between the houses as they face the streets, the back area. In, right. this, in this area or in this area? Either one, that area or the area on the other side parallel to it, but those two. Well, just to clarify, in this area, the front yep, doors to both these units face one another. Through whereas, in the inside? So this would be considered the front area that's connected to the interconnected pathway. 
right. and the rear is facing the street where the garage would I be. See. Whereas that's the same for all the row style. So the row style faces the front door faces the pathway. I got you along this internal courtyard. Whereas the duplex styles have the driveways that face the street, and the rear of the properties face here. Um, Peter and I had a similar discussion about fencing. There is a condition for a fencing plan to be provided at the building stage. One of the things that he made assurances of that this uh, area would not be closed off so as to provide appropriate landscaping, but there would be a raised deck above for private open space. And I don't know if Peter wants to clarify. Right. Anything so further. we have different types of private open space throughout the project. Um, the perimeter houses, which are I'm like not concerned about those. Well, I, let me, I'm let just me asking for the interior ones because those have they're no problem there. They face out. There's there's not really an issue there. These I'm I'm asking because they're so close. I mean, if you were right. So, yeah. so let me let me try to answer the question. Uh, we have different unit types, um, and the ones that you're concerned with are the ones that are in the interior. In the interior, we have two unit types. There is a row, what we call the row house style unit, and a duplex style unit. Now, each of those unit types have we have different solutions for private open space. The row house units, the open spaces, all contained within. Um, uh, decks and balconies that are within the footprint of the building. And so uh, I don't know if Justin has a slide of one of the row houses that I could elaborate and try to clarify this, but um, perhaps the other, the, the uh, perspective rendering might be easier to understand, like this. Now you see on, uh, for instance, the, uh, the rear elevation, uh, wherever you see a trellis, like right there, that would be a trellis over the private open space, okay? And then we also have, in, on some units, the open space on the front of the unit. So like right where Justin just had his cursor, right there up by that boxy area there, um, there's actually two different types of open space. There's, a, there's a, 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 a terrace with the trellis, and then right next to it, we have another balcony on the next unit. So we've, we've solved open space. Uh, by having different types of design solutions so that it creates more variety and it's not so monotonous. Now on the duplex uh, uh, style house, we have um, ray we, we actually have different uh, solutions there too. Um, there are certain duplex houses that have the balcony on the back, they're all on the back side uh, and, and in this particular example it's over a storage unit. We have other examples of this duplex style house in which the, uh, the balcony is just over open space down below. And so I hope that answers or helps to clarify the, the yeah, concern. So, you went, so you're saying basically there's balconies and so on. There's not really a fence patio behind the interior units. They essentially the structure supports whatever private space they have, balconies, decks. Uh, that, that is correct, yes. For, for the, for the uh, row houses and for the duplex style houses, that is correct. Okay. Other questions? I have a couple questions. Um, for the city, uh, criteria for affordability, are we doing 120% of median, 80% of median, a mixed bag? What's going on? Our, our, our affordable housing ordinance requires uh, a range, so there will be a mix of affordability between um, low, moderate, and above moderate. And then um, the other question I have uh, uh, is for the applicant. Um, the uh, amenities, bocce ball courts and playgrounds and things, are those public or private? Can anybody go and use those, or is that just for the residents? Uh, it's primarily for the residents, but enforcement of um, public coming to use is going to be probably very difficult to achieve. Okay. We do have public access, however, to the nature trail, so members of the public are welcome to come in and drive into the project and park at designated spots where they could they have an accessible path leading down to their our nature trail. So trying to enforce those people from not wandering around the rest of the project is going to be a task left up to the HOA to sort out. So 
th that was my next question with the HOA, um, and I don't know if we can ask, answer that. It, maybe it's it's premature, but um, the HOA is obviously taking care of the roads because those are private. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so then they'd also be taking care of these recreational amenities. Yes. And um, some other, well, landscaping, obviously, and then it's painting and all those kinds and of things. And even the trail itself. Oh, okay. The the actual public trail. Yeah. So the HOA has been. Con I believe there's a condition that the HOA maintain that. That's oh. correct. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. So the the trail's being built and maintained at no expense to the taxpayer. Okay. Oh, wow. That's nice. That sounds good. Um, and I'm going to ask a question that um, Commissioner Dan. I'm surprised you didn't ask this. Um, <laughs> the it looks like most of the units have tandem parking, uh, one after the other. Uh, the so you pull uh, in one and then you pull in the other. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, that that is correct. The row house style and the duplex style units do in fact have tandem parking. Yes. Okay, so I I don't. That's kind of well. That's just an interesting thing, and sometimes people don't use it that way. But <laughs> I'll just <laughs> throw it out there. It's not a big buyer's feature. <laughs> they don't look for those types of garages. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is the, just a comment on the school uh, amount. Um, we also need to consider that um, a lot of people in this town don't send their kids to the public schools. Um, they send them to private schools, which means driving on other streets, which get impacted as well. So, you know, that's something that, you know, you're paying money to the public school, but... Um, the rest of us who live around that area, kind of on the periphery, are going to get impacted by the fact that a lot of people don't want to send their kid to maybe the local public school. They want to send them to somewhere else. So that's also an, you know, a, a, an impact that that will impact all of us who live in that whole area. Um, I am going to assume that we can move to the public hearing. So I would like to thank the public for waiting. Thank you to the applicant. I appreciate that. Thank you very um, much. And I would like to thank the public. I know it's long, and I appreciate your waiting. Um, so if you would like to come forward and state your name and um, what area you live in, then we can, we'd be happy to listen to your commentary. OK. Good evening, Chair and Planning Commission again. My name is Jessica Jensen, and I live at 1778 Santa Victoria Avenue. And I actually appreciate sitting and listening because I had concerns, but um, I didn't realize how much more impact they actually are going to affect us. But based on listening to everybody's presentation, it's more serious than I thought. I'm, I didn't actually think I may have to sell my home, but I'm considering it now. A lot of my neighbors have, um, mostly because of the traffic. Um, I don't understand the math in my head is not going to make sense to me if we have that many new people in a home how the traffic is going to uh, be remedied by a stop sign that's people going in and out with the one way I would like to see more in and out streets bridges I think I spoke to the mayor once in my home and he talked about some access street too as well to deflect the traffic I want to make sure that we're heard and we're not forgotten because the development that's across the street from my house which is actually adding to my sleeping woes and that's why I'm so tired I'm also one of the commuters to go over the hill it takes an hour and 15 minutes some days to come back from over the hill because there's so little um, housing it just you know makes an ongoing problem the housing the traffic and here in Watsonville we're a little more unique because we do have a little bit more lower income and what I, plant, what I see neighbors doing is I see that they're renting out the homes to like uh, all four rooms and then they'll have maybe two or three people and those people have cars too. So parking's an issue, traffic's an issue, um, spacing's another issue. And then when people do that, they're out wandering and their kids are running around and I'm worried for those kids and you know cars coming and going. Um, just I don't want them to forget you know, that we are really concerned. Um, I did have another neighbor, she couldn't stay very long too, and her concerns are similar too, as well as my direct neighbor, Hilda here. Um, and then also a fourth neighbor who couldn't be here, she talked about how 
the, the plan that's being built right across from our home that they proposed one way and changed it completely and we didn't have say. Um, there's gonna be a lot of traffic there and I'm really sad that I wasn't here to you know talk earlier. The sign that was there was posted and I guess the rain washed it away and it's gone. Um, but it makes me really sad because I really like Watsonville. I came here in 2015. It was a really beautiful, it's still a beautiful area. We um, <clears throat> formed the neighborhood watch to try to keep, keep watch over each other because there was a lot of element coming from the slough. A lot of people coming and stealing from our homes. And um, I, like to, I like to be proud enough to say that we cleaned up the neighborhood, we watch each other's backs, and I just know that also that's gonna be a concern, um, you know, depending on how they open up that whole area because a lot of people come and go at night and even though I'm back and forth myself at night and day as well, um, it's an issue. And I, I just want you guys to remember us in approving this plan. Thank you very much for your comments. Are, are there other people that would like to speak? No? Anybody else? Seeing none, um, I will bring it back to commission discussion. No? I have a, a question then, uh, you know, um, following up on what this woman just expressed. What is the road that goes, um, so, okay, so Lisa, you and I went in on that road to, to the property when, I, when you showed that property to me. What's the name of that road, that access road the, um, between the Del Rio Court and the uh, Lighthouse development? Is that a possibility for access as well? Or what, what's, what is that? <laughs> I don't have a pointer, but you can see it on kind of the bottom, the bottom left of your screen. That is, um, love that. Maybe the applicant or, or Justin, you want to speak to that that easement and access and and how that all works. Well, <clears throat> I believe this is Arrington Road. Oh, right. Yes, I think that's right. And as you may be aware, they're proposing to put the roadway within an existing public access easement. There was always planned for Loma Vista to be extended into the site. There is, I believe, also a public access easement along here. There was some considerations for connecting into the uh, adjoining site of Sunshine Gardens. There was always supposed to be road extension. However, it would have to cross private property and the property owner would not um, sell the property if at a reasonable cost for them to do so. So that's the reason why they selected only this access. So that sliver of kind of that sort of triangular cone-shaped sliver is private property, is that correct? This, yes. Uh, this going up? This right here? Yeah. That's private property. Okay, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, so but there's no um, possibility of uh, ingress and egress on, from um, Ohlone Parkway onto the property from that access road there? That this current access road right here? Right. Again, I think they would have to acquire some rights from the property owner if they so chose to make that the primary access. And I, I'll leave it to the applicant to speak to what the negotiations entailed and what their thoughts were there. Okay. Would that be possible for somebody on the applicant to speak to that? Thank you. Reopening the public hearing, or is this? Are we still in? It, um, are you in deliberation right now? We're still gathering information, so we. This is uh, questions for staff or applicant. Well, to to answer the question, I think that you're not really um, solving the problem, even if we considered using that road extension, because you're still going to have. It's really just a tenth of a mile away from Loma Vista. And so any cars that are going to be going down there are going to be re-entering um, Ohlone Parkway with the same amount of traffic. It, it doesn't really solve any congestion problems. Well, would it ease Loma Vista a little bit? 
but not perhaps a little bit. But but yeah. um, right now we're relying on the uh, the EIR's conclusion about the traffic moving forward, and we're still willing to do this special condition that uh, Justin mentioned to you. Then let me, Maria Steck, can I ask you a question again? Um, I have to find my notes here. Um, somewhere in the EIR, it talked about um, on-ramp and off-ramp, new off of um, Lee, is it, no, it's not Lee Road, it's um, Green, uh, Green Valley, Harkin Slough. So, is there going to be eventually a new on freeway on-ramp and off-ramp somewhere on that area that is, I can't find it right at the moment. I don't want to take the time to do that. So. I, I believe what I recollect is there was a study of the ramps on and off at Riverside Drive in Highway 1. Okay, right, 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 yes. Correct. So I believe they're contributing um, their fair share contribution to improvements at those <laughs> ramps. Okay. And I believe it, it was also discussed about uh, Highway 1 Harkin Sioux. But there are no, there's currently no ramps being proposed at that particular area. I think what we're looking at are improvements for pedestrian safety and operational improvements in that area, and that's near the Pajar Valley High School. Okay, because I see here on page 367 of the EIR, it says uh, the general plan and the, cumulative and the cumulative conditions forecasts assume completion of the Highway 1 Harkin Slough Road interchange, including the addition of a new southbound off-ramp and northbound on-ramp. I believe that is indeed in the general 2005 general plan. Okay. Yeah, and, and that particular area has been evolving because that plan was done before the high school was there and oh. other things happened. So again, we've been reevaluating that whole area. And again, it may be the operational improvements will include a bike and ped bridge over Highway 1 and operational improvements at the signals nearby there. So um, again, ramps were originally planned, but that's still being reevaluated, and it looks like that may not be the case. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, do, do we have any more questions from the commission for the applicant or staff? No. Um, do we? In, I in, we <coughs> to answer, try to answer, if I can come back to the access issue that you're, and see if I can more directly answer your question. I opened up attachment six, and on page three, You'll see that's the track map for the Sea Fruit View Ranch. It clearly shows that Loma Vista future road extension of 60 feet. It also shows the right of way along the property boundaries for the subject site shown as clusters and the adjoining property which is owned by Mr. Campos. You see on this, the Sea View Ranch side, the right of way is only 30 feet wide. So to meet the city's standard for a roadway, they would need say, at least 20 to 30 feet to be able to construct a public access road to the site, which would involve purchasing or acquiring the rights to 20 to 30 feet on Mr. Campos' property, which they don't have. Okay, all right, that answers that question, thank you. Um, so, I wanna take into account what the public commentary was um, and concerns about traffic, which you know we all know is a concern. Um, and but do we have a motion? Um, and before we do that, can, can we can clarify that there will be a stop sign at um, the westbound off of uh, Loma Vista. Is that correct? That is a condition of approval. Yes, that's that. I wrote that in the record as a suggested condition of approval to be included as a recommendation to council. Okay. Um, do we have a motion? Are we in discussion? Or are we still in discussion? Hey, Amen. Oh, go ahead. I'll make a motion. <laughs> Sorry. So I first would like to thank both the applicant. That was an excellent presentation, and I would like to thank the neighbors for coming and expressing your views tonight. We really appreciate it. Heck, you've been here 
two and a half hours, and uh, that's quite a commitment. So hope your neighbors thank you for this. Uh, these are tough decisions. It's not fun some nights to sit in these seats because at the end of the night, somebody will be disappointed. And we understand that and appreciate that. But I'm going to vote for the project for a couple reasons. Number one, I like the project. I, I do. I think uh, at the end of the day, we're running out of space, and this is a, a good space. And for all those people watching at home, all dozen of you, 14 of you, <laughs> if any of us hope to have our own children live in this community someday, it's becoming less and less probable as the prices and the limits that we have become much more prevalent. I mean, we're already up to five, $600,000 houses. If we don't build anything, it's, just, it's gonna continue. And most of the people that we care about and would like to live with won't have the opportunity to live in our own community. And I understand the neighbors. I'd probably feel the same way if I lived next to a vacant field and somebody did this, but a different story a little bit on this one, and I'd just like to end with this and, and put the motion forward. This was a junkyard. Since I was a kid, it's been a junkyard. And it was an awful junkyard. It wasn't even a nice junkyard. It's bad as far as junkyards go. <laughs> and there was a lot of environmental damage. Heck, we didn't care in the 70s. We, we threw garbage out the window. So this type of situation existed, and nobody really cared. We have an opportunity to change that. I understand, I did talk to the developer. Nobody wanted to touch this project. Who wants to come in and spend millions of dollars cleaning up somebody else's mess and then turn around and try and make a profit off of a development? I'm not completely happy with it. I think the rec area for the kids should be twice as big and they should have left off a half a dozen houses and made the area bigger. But I also understand that costs money and I would rather have the project than a, than a junkyard, and I'd rather have a smaller rec area with the homes than no homes at all. So I'm gonna make a motion that uh, we approve the project as written. Can we have other commentary, or is it, yeah? Uh, are there other? Well, first of all, oh, okay. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Um, uh, with a friendly encouragement to the city to consider their own traffic study right now because the impacts that people are feeling there are right now. They're not gonna be after they're, uh, they built the 150 houses, five, six years. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, traffic, uh, you know, our issues are there. Um, so if you could allow me to add just, uh, you, you know, then, you know, the friendly encouragement that the city should consider doing the traffic. I would be fine with that as long as the city council would have to approve it, correct? Can you clarify exactly what what you would like this? No, just a statement. I mean, it's oh, not. Okay. It's not. And it's not. You know, a condition. It, it's is not a condition, a, okay. but uh, to the uh, city council to consider a uh, traffic study now. You know, from didn't they just uh, do one? Isn't that no? It's, it's, it's here because it's they been, just did a traffic. Yeah, they study. Did, they've they've done a complete traffic study for the project. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then and that's why they're waiting yeah. five years. Then I uh, rest my case. <laughs> I, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, I would have that. accepted it anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I turned you down. But uh, I'll second that. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, I understand uh, people's concerns, but um, the housing impact, you know, is driving families apart right now in the community. Um, people are having um, having to push out or live with each other because the housing, the way the housing market is, um, when we, and we need to provide uh, options for the community because there are none. You know, we're being pushed out because of the prices. Um, I know and now and, uh, and now you know go to the realtor now, not to bang on any realtor. <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, the first thing they're, they're telling you is go to Los Baños <laughs> or uh, somewhere else because there's no, there's, no, uh, uh, there's n no houses here. So we need to provide some leadership in some houses and um, so we need to move forward. Thank you. Other co commentary? Go ahead. <laughs> Can I um, request that you um, also request the city council to to make certain recommendations where there's some type of scoring system that when they, the houses are sold that at least 
there's preference. You give a, a number, let's say, to um, a Watsonville resident to have priority uh, buying uh, or at least um, m you know, going through the process. Because where, and this is, uh, I believe I caught part of the, the comment that was made earlier, is that a lot of people that live in that area work over the hill. So they're really not uh, residents, well they are residents of Watsonville now, but I would really like to see that local residents now can have an opportunity to at least purchase a home. We can definitely look into that and that is um, on the affordable units in the lottery um, applicants that live and live and or work in Watsonville will have more um, more entries into the lottery for the affordable units, but we can look into the possibility um, or legality of doing that for the market rate units as well. Thank you. Other commentary? I, I just had a question on kind of on that note. Is there are there limitations or conditions we can put on it that say that the units have to be owner occupied for a certain period of time? Rivera, did you have something? No? I, I also want to say that the um, project looks very well thought out, and um, I, it, it's really great that it has uh, so much uh, open space around and that you're repairing the, um, the habitat in that area, so I want to thank you for that as well. So it looks like we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have roll call, please? Dana? Yes. Jones? Yes. Montesino? Yes. Sarmiento? Yes. Beach Olson? Yes. Rivera? Yes. Kammer? Yes. All right, so the motion passes unanimously. Um, once again, I'd like to thank the public for being here, and uh, we appreciate your commentary, and know that this is going on to the city council, so um, that you know that's another space for you to either come and make your comments or you can also write to your city council member um especially your district um it's uh is it jimmy dutra i believe is that correct yeah okay so you can write to your council member as well and get get your neighbors to do that too so that they hear you so i appreciate you being here um looks like we are on to the report of the secretary I mess up? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, not too much to report. We did issue the building permit for the hotel on Beach and Lee Road, so that's going to be under construction soon. Um, if I had didn't already say, we've got a Popeye, Popeyes under construction by Grocery Outlet. <laughs> whether you're excited or not there's a Popeyes coming to town <laughs> never eaten at a Popeyes but maybe one of these days I'll have to try it well, um, that's one place where we need a light <laughs> <laughs> yes it is madness yes. that yes. intersection is is a nightmare yeah, yeah Maria <laughs> <laughs> don't leave yet <laughs> <laughs> thank you and um the apartments at 445 Main are just about done so surprise, um, the, terrace. the terrace, yes, the terrace. So, um, yeah, more housing there online soon. And that's that's all I got. Happy summer, everybody! Yay! All right. With that, the meeting is <laughs> adjourned. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody.